You're listening to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 54. This week, we're going to share with you some of the games you'll like if you also like Settlers of Catan. And we're also reviewing Diamonds, Revolution, the Anarchy expansion, and Aquasphere. In our final round, we're going to take a look at some of the best Press Your Luck games. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, a podcast about gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Anthony. This is Chris. And this is Drew. Hey, Drew's back. He is back. (laughs) It's Drew. For one night only. (laughs) For one night only. He's a limited edition character in this board game. This is my very last podcast that I will be recording in Staten Island. There you go. The next time you hear my voice. Drag that out longer. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, apparently this is the uh, six-month period where everybody moves, and we get to figure (laughs) out the creative way through Skype that we can actually record these. Um, well, uh, yeah. does that mean, does that does that mean when Drew moves up north, he'll have a different accent on the podcast from now on? I hope so. That was part of the deal. If he wants to Vermonters stay on, Vermonters don't really have an accent. It's that's the main you're thinking of. <laughs> accent, make it happen, Drew. Hey, uh, all right. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> that's Maine. <laughs> ah, got it. That I'll take it. Farm remembers. All right. So, welcome to the episode, everybody. Episode fifty-four. We have a very special feature today. Um, something we want to try that's new. If you like Settlers of Catan, then there are many other games that we would like to recommend that go slightly beyond that uh, entry level. So uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later in the episode, but that's something new we're going to share with you today. Uh, something fun that we've been working on for a little bit. Cool. You're close to you're close to that accent, but not there yet. Yeah. You got to <laughs> physically be there. You got to practice, man. You got to practice. Got to move was there. Childlike. That was cool. I'm a little obsessed with accents because I'm from Seattle and I like to think I don't really have much of an accent. I don't think there's a natural accent out West. Um, but my son, who was born here in Brooklyn, because after we moved, he actually has a pretty significant accent he's developing. <laughs> and to me, that's just like the weirdest thing in the world that it's not genetic somehow. And I know it's not. It's just it's weird to me that my son of two parents who have no accent at all sounds uh like somebody out of the sopranos at three years watching, old <laughs> watching too much hbo obviously. right um <laughs> now i'm from philadelphia i grew up in, outside of philadelphia for the longest time i had a philly accent um it creeps through still once in a while but you know who you know what a philly accent is if you watch american horror story their carnival thing the kathy bates character is from philadelphia she pulled this weird accent out of nowhere. That's a Philly accent. Isn't it like really you... weird O's? Is that... That's it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> my, wife's, a... my wife's from Trenton, so whenever she hears that O, oh, she knows where somebody's oh, from. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Only mildly off topic, but... Uh... Welcome to the O podcast, the podcast about vowels <laughs> and the way you can say them. We got a new board game brewing here, guys. Excuse me, I have to grab a drink of water. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's another Philly thing. Oh my gosh! So my wife's definitely not listening to this episode. <laughs> and when right. I die, you can bury me. Are yins done yet? Yuns, <laughs> yuns, yeah, there. Yins. No, it's the, the it's yins from Pittsburgh. I used to live in Pittsburgh, and that's it's about the yins. You guys are a whole bunch of yins. Yuns or yous, yous guys. No, New York is yous, yous guys. Come on, Philly, yous guys. Philly, yous. Y- it would just we would just say use, not use guys, just use. We are currently alienating seventy five percent of our <laughs> listeners. <laughs> People oh, in Germany right. are like, what? New record. <laughs> oh man. Well, welcome to the episode, and I promise we are going to talk about board games very, very soon. Uh, is there an episode in here somewhere? <laughs> it's it's happening. I think it's happening right now. Uh, <laughs> let's see how much of this I cut. Uh, before we dive into all that stuff, I did want to have one announcement. Um, outside of the Shout It From The Tabletop segment. We are actually only minutes slash possibly this has already been done away from launching our very own customized Patreon campaign. Yes! 
<laughs> Drew's very excited. He's been talking about this oh, for much longer than we've been planning it. The Patreon campaign, which should be up this weekend, very, very soon to this. I'm supposed to be doing that as we speak. That is, um, it's our chance basically to, you know, cover some of the expenses we have. Uh, podcasts cost a little bit to put up. Um, and thus far, we've kind of done this out of sheer joy of the hobby and of doing this podcast. We all have a heck of a lot of fun doing it, so we keep doing it. Um, but there's so much cool stuff we want to do that's kind of beyond the scope of what we can currently fit in slash afford. Um, and this is our chance, and hopefully, you know, your chance as the listeners out there, to kind of connect and help us do some of that cool stuff, you know. And once it's up, we'll definitely you can take a look. We'll post it to the blog. You should take a look there and get a full rundown of it. And the next episode, we'll have a very detailed run through of each of the pledge levels that we're just finalizing right now. But some of the cool stuff we've been talking about is we want to hold more contests. Um, that's something we haven't been able to do nearly as often as we'd like. But that's something we're going to roll out on a you know every other month basis is get more chances for you guys to kind of interact with the content in the podcast but also win some cool stuff some hot new games um we also want to get your feedback um and we get lots of great feedback but more direct like you'll have your chance if you're part of this to kind of not necessarily dictate but maybe vote or get your opinion heard on the podcast about what we're going to cover what our feature is going to be what games we play um i'm going to put a, putting up a polls and various surveys that are really only for backers um, through that Patreon campaign. And it's just a way to kind of, you know, make your voice heard as a listener. Um, and a lot of you already do, which is awesome. So I definitely want to hear more of that. But kind of just keep building this community that we've got going, which really excites us. But make do it in a way that we can actually kind of grow and do more stuff. So we have a lot of plans for 2015. I think this is going to be a really awesome way to help us kind of hit that next level and uh, do all the things we talk about in the cuts between the episodes uh, when we're uh, brainstorming that we never quite get to. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from, from you guys, you listeners, to, to find out what it is you want us to do, what directions you want us to go in, things to try. It, it's exciting. It's like, uh, I, I can't wait to see what you want us to do. We'll do it. The thing is, we want this to be our podcast, not just the people who are podcasting, but everyone out there who's listening we want you to be part of this, lead us, tell us what you want to hear, comment, respond. We're really looking forward to building a bigger anonymous community where we're all one. And literally, you may get that chance to be to join us, uh, depending on our pledge goals, how we finalize uh, the pledge levels. You yeah. may get to join us for an episode. That would be cool, too. Yeah, or, you know, we definitely plan on hitting up uh, some of the conventions this year. Um, you know, last year we... Didn't quite have the opportunity to go uh, other than PAX East. So if, you know, that could be another pledge level that we're working on as well. If, you know, you're going to be at Gen Con or any of these other conventions. Um, there's lots of cool stuff. And keep in mind, too, that we've always kept this podcast ad-free. We don't have any ads on the podcast. And that's something I'd like we'd like to maintain is to continue to be ad-free moving forward. And this would really help us do that. If you're listening to this, the Patreon should be up. Take a look, check it out, watch Chris's awesome video, and, uh, you know, if nothing else, send us a quick comment and just let us know that you listen and you enjoy what you hear, and um, we look forward to reading your comments. So send in your pledge now so that you can keep <laughs> this great NPR programming on the air. All right. So that is our uh, Patreon coverage for this week. I promise next week it'll be about half that long. Uh, a little more details about what's going on. Check out the blog. But for now, let's dive into the real news with Drew. Shout it from the tabletops! <laughs> Sir, you're gonna need to get down from there. Hey, let's shout it from the tabletop, folks. Um, quick, three quick um, product announcements. Some of you have already heard. These are really exciting announcements, actually. Um, finally, Pandemic Legacy has a date. Um, it's, not gonna, it's not going to be anywhere where we can go. It's going to be at Essen, uh, August 10th, 2015. I don't know. A Patreon stretch goal. Huh? Uh -huh. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> it 
<laughs> listen, send us to Essen and we will get some copies to give away in a contest. Definitely. So that's a biggie. Also, uh, Fantasy Flight came out with an announcement that they will be re-releasing Tigris and Euphrates, um, a game that we don't hear much about lately, but it, it's a classic now. It's a great game. And it's actually a part of a new line that Fantasy Flight is going to be creating the, um, what's it called? Euro Classics. There it is. And when I first read about that, I thought, Euro Classics. So that must mean maybe Fantasy Flight is going to release El Grande. It's like you <gasps> said it would. Is it? But Drew, they're Drew. not. What's, what's oh. the third oh. releasing El Grande? What's the third piece of news, Drew? What's the third piece of news? Oh, El Grande is being released. <laughs> <laughs> but by a Dutch company, nine ninety nine. So, Winning. Chris, you predicted it, and it came true. Well, it took long enough to get there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it only took like a month after the episode. It, it's <laughs> happening, man. Well, and guess what, Chris? Not only is uh -huh. El Grande being released, it's yeah, being yeah. released in a big box. Just right. like someone from this show predicted at the beginning of the year. That's, <sighs> the, future of, that's the future of gaming, big boxes. I tell you. So, Nine ninety nine is going to be releasing it um, soon. I didn't note the date. They've, they're always um, very ephemeral about the about dates. So as soon as we find out, we'll let you guys know. Well, it's happening. The fact that it's happening—that's all that matters. Two predictions Definitely. down already, and we're not even out of January. Two in one shot. I'm telling um, you guys. Speaking of predictions, I've been doing a series, uh, not of predictions, but of trends to watch for in the coming year uh, on Board Game Geek. Um, one of those articles got a, a shout out in their um, weekly flyer. But uh, one of the things I predicted is the rise of the Board Game Cafe. There's another, I, I got to tell you about this because it's fantastic. This place is going to be opening outside of Denver, Fort Collins, Colorado, Colorado in April, called Dungeons and Drafts. They got some photos of it. I'm going to post a link to that. This seems like where this trend is going. Really fancy, really cool cafes. This is a tavern in Dungeons & Dragons style. It's like an old Tudor-style beer hall with long tables, and it really puts you in the mood. It's, it looks like it's going to be a cool place to go and game. So that's exciting, um, and that's the future. We're going to see a lot more of these. Oh, something, something I just saw. It's making the rounds in emails, and it's not a cheap little thing. It's a flow chart that was created by this casino, Silver Oak Casino, and I saw it posted on Lifehacker. And it's a very detailed flow chart, not a cheap, crappy little one I've seen in the past. This has like dozens of games, and it breaks down a lot of choices. So if you're trying to figure out what kind of game you want to play, I'll, I'll run this over real quick with, with Anthony and Chris. Because the very first question they ask is, are you playing with children? So let me do you first, Anthony. Are you playing with children? Yes. Okay. So that's under yes. Are they younger than seven? Yes. Now, first of all, I got to ask you, your boy plays some very sophisticated games. So you could go either way on that. I could, although we did get him some games of his own uh, over the holiday, and he much prefers those to my games. So... Uh... Okay. He put me in so, my place a little bit. <laughs> so we'll go with yes then. Younger than seven. The next question is girly girls only? No. No. Okay. Real rules or just fun? Um, he likes rules. He just doesn't necessarily follow them. Um, <laughs> so yeah, let's say rules. Rules. Okay. The next question is actually fun for adults? God, yes, please. Okay. <laughs> The one that they recommended was Sorry. Huh. And, and actually, I just read a, an interesting uh, blog post by Denise Patterson something. She writes a uh, 365 Days of Gaming blog. She was telling about um, playing Sorry with her family and the great fun they had, parents and children. So that's a good recommendation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's not bad. But let me tell you, the rest of this, there's some really... Uh, sophisticated modern games. So, Chris, let's go with you. All right. Are you playing with children? No. No. Okay. So, this flow chart has us going a different direction. Play for more than two hours? Sure. Okay. Hardest rules ever? No. No. So, you avoided Axis and Allies then. Um, <laughs> so, no. All players in until the end? Yes. Okay. Their recommendation is Lahav. Does that sound right? 
about around there. It, it should be an there. Uwe game of some ilk, I guess. Yeah. Because they had, if you said no, they had a lot more questions to, to take you down the road. So You know what, Drew? No. Well, no. You're going to say no? Okay, I'm going to say no because I don't want to play Le Havre. Dice battles or 100% strategy? 100% strategy. Uh, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Board game? game? Thrones. Yeah. All right. I'm good with that. Okay. See? Yeah. So it's a pretty good chart. I'll post a link to that. I think it works really well. It's got all the basics, but, a, but dozens of options. Yeah, I'm looking at it, and I find myself, like, finding the names of games and trying to backtrack to see how you get there. Yeah. I'm like, ooh, Cosmic Encounter. How do I play that? <laughs> so. Yeah. Whatever mood you're in, whatever group you're with. And this this was created by somebody at a casino. There's no um, Silver Oak Casino. There's no name on it, so I have no idea oh, how to put this together. That is funny. This kind of stuff takes time. That's That's awesome. So good work into that. Mm -hmm. um, one final really bit of hard news. I think it's hard news. <laughs> You may think it's soft. Um, 538, the website created by Nate Silver, they'd already done a, a fascinating article about Twilight Struggle, what they called the, the greatest game ever invented. Now, they were going by Board Game Geek's rank, rankings. So it's number one in Board Game Geek, so they accepted that as fact and called it the best. They flipped that for their next article and created an article called The Worst Board Games Ever Invented, and they looked at the bottom of the board game geek. And you know what games you find at the bottom of the board game geek rankings? Monopoly. Monopoly and Yahtzee and Sorry and Tic Tac Toe and all those fun games. <laughs> <laughs> but but this is Nate Silver's real hard serious analysis. The fact that a website like them are taking the time it must be a slow winter. <laughs> but that they're looking into this is incredible. So I guess the question we need to come down that we need to talk about at some point is are the board game geek rankings really valid? I mean, I know this is not a scientific survey, but it really reflects serious gamers who don't like these. There are a lot of casual gamers that do like these. So can you really say that these are the worst games? Well, I mean, it's the site is called board game geek. So <laughs> these are the, Best and worst games to board game geeks. So us, you know. And stat heads like Nate Silver's gang. Yeah. They, they would, yeah, they would be on that. Um, I just think the classics need a little more respect because they're gateway games. And they sh there should be a separate category for classic games. Because, yeah, they're not going to compare well to what we're playing now, that's for sure. But yeah. I still think they need more love. Um. A couple more uh, quick items, really odd items, because I read about something in the Daily Mail a couple days ago. A Welsh hospital, hospital in Wales, was forced to chain toys to cots uh, with bicycle locks after thieves have been targeting children's wards. And I looked into this a little more. There's a lot of thievery going on in hospitals, in, in Britain uh, especially. The largest children's hospital in London, they had board games and iPads and Nintendos being stolen which is from a children's hospital man but it, it it got me to thinking that's what they need kids need these donations they need games they need things to to help them get through all the time they have to spend in hospitals and it made me think of a group that actually does something about it the spiel foundation which is created by these guys who have the spiel I want to say Spiel, the Spiel podcast. And they raise money to buy games to give to children's hospitals, which I think is really cool. I'd love to do something with them at some point in the future because, you know, reading this, this news article made me think, yeah, that's – they need these games, um, toys, games, whatever we can give. So – um, I was actually going to try and collect some information about different board game related charities and put that on the blog, but the Spiel Foundation is a great, uh, great group to do this. So I wanted to try and give some good news <laughs> at the end of that really sad bit of news, and that is everything we have to shout from the tabletop this week. So next up, we're going to take a look at some of our acquisition disorders from the last uh, couple weeks and some of the games we want to pick up. Our 
Acquisition Disorders. Acquisition Disorders? That's crazy! Only needs the base game, nothing else but the base game. The base game and the expansion. See? Nothing else. Just the base game and the expansion and the promos. The base game and the expansion and the promos and, of course, the upgraded components. Why wouldn't you have the upgraded components? So the base game, the expansion, the promos, and the upgraded components. See? That's not too much, but maybe, I don't know, maybe you might need the Explosion. <laughs> Right, so Acquisition Disorders. Uh, so obviously there's plenty of games scheduled to come out in 2015. Our last episode was our top 15 most anticipated games for the year. Um, I, did, I, did, did you get them yet? Are they here? Can I play them? Anthony, I, can I play them? Let's play no, them now. No, no. We don't do the no. podcast, right? Can we play them? Please, 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 <laughs> please, 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 please. No, 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 no. Do you have any? I don't have any. Do you have any? Hi. Because if you do, I will turn this off right now and we'll drive over there. We will play so many of them. <laughs> They're all going to be at Essen, and we're not going to be able to see them for, until next year. So, ah, hey, stop saying hey, that. Pessimism. God, Go how away. many games? What was it? How long did it take for King of New York to get here? Come on, this is. It's not our fault. There was a strike in on the West Coast, or whatever people were talking about. I don't, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's the most anticipated games of 2016 in some cases. <laughs> yeah. Well, almost certainly for some of them. Yeah. Um, but there are a couple that, like you said, Pandemic Legacy was announced. I actually left that off my list because I didn't know that that would be announced for this year, and then it was. So. Just stuck that on there, yeah. Yep. And El Grande. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so Drew's so gonna buy me that copy, right, Drew? It is so. <laughs> <laughs> he doubted me. We, we have audio you evidence about that. It. Listeners, you were a witness. Two of your seven predictions have already come true. He not mocked, even out of Anthony, January. Anthony, I hope you were listening because he mocked me. He mocked me. He mocked me. And yet, it came true. I know Grande. I, I knew El Grande was going to come. I kept waiting for it. <laughs> the big box, I don't know. Everybody, everything on Kickstarter is going to be big box now, I guess. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah, that's almost everything on there now. Um but there were a few games that did not make our list from last week or the last couple weeks. Um, for me, top of the list is Suburbia 5 Star. Nice. That was announced, I guess, just a few days ago. I just saw it pop up yes. on uh, Board Game Geek, and it jumped straight to number one on the hotness. Um, adding new mechanics to the game, adding new uh, tiles to the game, the... They actually have a full new resource now and 50 new building tiles, as well as the option for a fifth player, um, which is awesome. And anytime you expand a game and it doesn't break and you make it possible for more people to play, I'm all for it. Um, you want as many, many people as possible to be able to sit at the table, so that's awesome. And then they're saying the new star system helps determine player order, uh, some extra mm. bonuses, as well as some penalties. And it's focusing on the tourism friendliness of towns which is very interesting tourism friendliness yes so penalties and bonuses for the most and least f tourist friendly towns and then uh even some tiebreakers for public and private goals um if you've ever played if you've ever played this game you know that uh, there's always one person at the table who basically builds a toxic waste dump and, <laughs> and scores first what are you or second to say, in the man? game <laughs> Like, they go straight industrial the entire way, and it's, they get a lot of points, but it's almost depressing how horrible their city looks. Listen, uh, if, if they're going to bring tourists in, you know, I've lived in New York long enough, I can't stand tourists. <laughs> Sign me up for the toxic waste dump, okay? If that keeps the tourists out, I'm good We got landmarks, <laughs> monuments, tourist traps, it's all sorts of new types of buildings. Oh, I don't know, they're man. expanding suburbia, so that's all I really need to hear. Um, and I'm all for it. So, <laughs> right. yeah, Suburbia is one of my favorite games of all time. It's SimCity in the board game, yes. and you, for me personally, I have the board game. I have the expansion. I love playing it. I play on the iPad a ton. This expansion is really nice because it it also adds some. We should talk about some of these funny tiles. The ones that they were able to release, they talked about Alien Mountain. So it actually has the mountain from Close Encounters. And each time you pass a line, which is one of the on the scoring track, you lose a person. So every time <laughs> passing on the mountain, you're losing people. Um, Busy A Games Arena, Easy Burger, the Island Resort. So anything you can add to this game to give it a little more flavor, because it is a bit dry. And you know, it's it's not the worst thing in the world, but uh, 
yeah, I, I just can't wait to play this game. I'm curious. I mean, I, I do, seriously, I have this goal now. I want to try and win that expansion while keeping tourists out. I want to see if I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's doable. That'll be fun. You could win the first the first expansion for the game. You could win without using those new uh, the border tiles. So yes, it's, absolutely, it's very feasible. Now the game I'm I'm really looking forward to playing is it's that rare rare type of game called a sequel. That's my phrase for it. It's not an expansion. Okay. It's not a skin. It's not a reiteration. It's a sequel. It's called Discoveries, and it's by the same designer of Lewis and Clark, a French name that I won't even attempt to pronounce right now. But Come I on, am Drew, a... Try, try to pronounce it. Everyone, everyone deserves a laugh. No, no, no. No, <laughs> <laughs> no not in, in a Maine accent, a New England accent. Um, I, I'm a theme monger. I guess that's, that's the phrase. Give me a theme and I'll mong it. I just... I, I love themes and I really enjoyed Lewis and Clark, the theme and what he's doing is basically taking the characters, uh, the, the expedition leaders and focusing on them and, um, in a whole new way in they're basically, as the title says, discoveries, they're going to discover information. It's not about the trip. Now it's about the mental effort of, finding new things, discovering um, new uh, fauna uh, and new flora and new places to new vistas. It's a dice placement game, so that's familiar enough. That That's like the hot thing, thing now. So many really interesting games are, are dice placement. Um, but it's going to continue that history uh, of uh, these expedition leaders and trying to acquire knowledge. Be the first and be the most. So, again, the theme has me hooked. I want to try it. Yeah, I mean, I, I like Lewis and Clark a lot. Um, there were obviously some issues with the game in various areas from our review. I think I liked it the most of the four of us. Um, maybe I was just more forgiving because I messed up the rules. But um, <laughs> I had fun. I enjoyed it. I've played it a couple times since. I've run through the solo variant, which we'll talk about in a couple weeks. Um, so I'm excited to see... Uh, the new game and what he's you know what he's doing with it um, it sounds interesting to me for sure yeah spinoff yeah that's awesome so, I love the idea of linked games because it's it just gives you like an easy immediate entry level to that next game because you already you know where where to begin where yeah. to start mm -hmm. so the game that I'm really looking forward to is Orleans right now it's available on Kickstarter this is a bag building game so not a deck building game not a dice building game but you're actually placing workers in this bag. You're pulling different workers in order to help you, traders, builders, scientists, knights, in order to expand your scope in the city to have different possibilities of different abilities throughout the game. It's just a very different type of mechanic that we haven't seen before, at least not implemented this way. The box, the artwork looks a little odd, but the gameplay is really innovative, and it's it's something nice to see. And once again, as I, I predicted earlier, they have another one of these kind of expanded mega editions for it. So if you're looking forward to a really heavy Euro on Kickstarter where you can pick up those nice kind of quality pieces, Orleans is available now on Kickstarter. Now, when you say bag builder, I, I think of Steam Park. S similar to that? Or... Or well, you're, this one, you're, you're recruiting different people who have different abilities. So where Steam Park, you're pulling out, like, patrons to kind of go on your rides, and they're just meeples. This, they have the tiles that actually have special abilities, and they activate in different areas. So it's a little more of a complexity in that kind of how you okay. play the characters and where they go. I mean, those, so those are three of our uh, acquisition disorders that you did not hear last week. Um, next up, we're going to take a look at some of the games that we've actually been playing lately. At the table this week. So, games we've been playing lately. Um, I'll actually leave this off, and I have not been playing a lot of games the last two months or so because i haven't really left my house a ton why uh, i know i'm a slacker slacker man right 
Um, <laughs> Get on that. <laughs> I played a lot of games for three-year-olds, including uh, I Spy and Busy Town. Okay. And uh, Jumping Jack. And what was the other one he got? I did get him Robot Turtles, which he does like. Um, oh, not, good. It's not a, it's not much of a board game per se, but it's it's a really good like experience slash activity for a, a kid his age. He has a lot of fun with it, and he's learning a ton. Um, the second like the day after Christmas, we were done with my games because he had like five of his own from various members of my family, <laughs> um, which which are much more fun for a three year old to play a game at his level. Uh, so that's what we've been doing for the last month. He'll come back. Don't worry. Oh uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not too worried about it. Um, <laughs> we've we've played Imperial Settlers a couple times, but not wow. not a whole lot else. Can I get him on my some mice and mystics? We're getting there, man. Like you got him the uh, Chris actually came over after my daughter was born and he brought the two plush uh, characters from the game. So I think it was Colin and Lily. Mm -hmm. uh from my Mystics that plaid hat put out and these are awesome stuffed animals by the way they they're like old school so they're like everything's attached with the buttons they're like high quality stitching they're like they're solid too so my son can't break it um so we got the colin was for jack and then lily was for uh, abigail my daughter and jack he's he keeps moving around in the house and they're on these little adventures that i don't quite understand um that my daughter is somehow involved in. Jack, Jack could tell Aww. you the story better than I could. But um, he doesn't really want to play the game, but he really likes playing with the animals. So I think we're getting closer. Um, there you go. It's, it's a good gateway. <laughs> the gateway to the gateway game, the yeah. stuffed animal. I think as soon as he fully understands what's happening on the board, we'll be fine. Mark out a dungeon right on the floor, and then just use the plush toys to move around the floor. Right? <laughs> just even just part draw the grid. <laughs> You probably could even just play him the audio, you know, recordings for the books with, you know, and have the stuffed animals. Yeah, we're getting there. He definitely sits and listens to stories more. Um, we don't need like five page picture books. We can actually read a chapter in a book and he'll, he'll be nice. in, He'll enjoy that. Okay. So we're getting there. I think we're really close. I'm excited. I want to play these games. <laughs> uh, got Imperial Assault over Christmas. That's like the next step from my Mystics. And then over the Christmas break, he did discover Star Wars, uh, the movies, and we've watched those Ooh. a few times now, and he's obsessed. So bring out the miniatures. I'm, I'm getting him there. I'm <laughs> converting this child to full nerd. It's happening. <laughs> Together, you both will Ooh. rule the universe as father and son. <laughs> Jack, I am your father. Please play these games with me. He's like, yeah, I know. I know you're my father. Yeah. <laughs> You, you've been around since I was born. What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> you might want to try an inhaler, Dad. I'm not, I'm not too sure what's going on here. You know, long stories aside, there were actually a couple of games I got to the table um, legitimately uh, with my wife uh, during the break after my daughter was born. The first of which is a game that I kind of picked up on a lark because it was only, I think, 8 or $9 um, on sale from Miniature Market during one of their holiday sales. Um and I picked up a bunch of other stuff, and I threw this one on there because everybody was talking about it, and that was Diamonds. Um, so everybody describes this as a trick-taking game, so <laughs> I assume... Hey, Anthony, I, you I know assume, that Diamonds game? Yeah, I did. It's a trick-taking game. Yeah, that's what I heard. People tell me that. But <laughs> For no I, reason, because they all know that you like trick-taking exactly. games so much. So I tried so hard to avoid it because I assumed I wouldn't like it, but... Uh, you know, I got it for seven, eight bucks. I figured if I hated it, it would be a good gift. It is a trick-taking game, but it's got just enough strategy involved that I'm not going to call it a trick-taking game. Uh, it's a, it's a strategy card game. It's, there are ways to win, uh, that are not related to trick-taking at all. Like it doesn't matter. Winning the tricks definitely helps, but it's not vital to winning the game. So just by giving it another name, you can still hate trick-taking games. Is that it? You're just calling it something else. Yeah, pretty much. I'm deferring. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's genius what Mike Fitzgerald did with this game, though. Like in injecting that new mechanic of the uh, the diamonds and how you collect them with the different suits makes it so you always have something to do no matter what your uh, hand looks like. Um 
because you can always get diamonds from that. You're going to get a little more out of things if you win more tricks because then you get bonuses at the end of each round. But it's not vital because every card you play can benefit you. You can actually do poorly and do better because if you don't have cards that match the current trick, you're going to get benefits every time you play a card. Um, that's really cool to me. And even though my wife beat me like <laughs> four out of five times, um, which is pretty typical, I had a lot of fun, which is super, super rare in a trick-taking game, especially if I'm losing. It's just the reason I don't like trick-taking games is because there's too many instances where you're just not doing anything. And it it really requires you to have fun with the group around you and be, you know, joshing around. Um, this game requires you to think a little bit, but not too much. So you can still have fun. But if you're running behind and not winning, you can still have a chance to win. You never feel like the game just beat you because of uh, the draw. So very solid. I'm happy I bought it. I'm going to keep it. Um, this is a game I'll pull out more often. So um, it's a buy for me. Solid game. One wow. of the better trick-taking games I've ever played. This is this is a monumental day <laughs> and a monumental day. <laughs> Anthony likes a trick taking game. Chris, it's not a trick taking game because Anthony says it isn't. So there's no, where it is. It's not. It's not. It's a strategy <laughs> trick taking. game. It's a strategy taking game. <laughs> it's a trick strategy. Game. I'll work on that, but it's not a trick taking game. It's. It's the perfect refinement of the trick-taking mechanic. Um, I'm super excited, too, because Mike's, Mike Fitzgerald has another card game coming out. His Baseball Highlights uh, 2045. That should be coming out in the next few months from Kickstarter. Um, and so after playing this, I'm like, this guy's a genius. I want that baseball game. <laughs> so, I'll, Okay. <laughs> then on, based on that, I love baseball games. So we'll, I'll look forward to that. Yeah. I'm curious. Definitely worth it. If you see this game uh, sitting around, I think it's only 15 20 bucks. Well worth picking up. Check it out. The game that I played recently was Revolution, the Anarchy expansion. Now, Revolution is a game which I introduced you guys to, if I recall. You do, right. Uh, I did. I, I was in love with that game for quite a while. Philip DeBerry had, had a great game. It's just I grew up, I grew older, and I, I switched to Dominaire, which is... One of my all-time favorites. Both games are very similar, but uh, I still love Revolution, and I, I'm glad I had a chance to come back to that and play the Anarchy expansion. Um, we played it the same night that we played the Palace expansion, which was interesting. You can compare the two. Anarchy, well, as the as the word means, it, it has negative connotations. And so it's a first for Revolution where the expansion creates negative spaces that you can play in. And obviously, um, there are a couple chances to use that, one of which is to send another player's cubes into the negative space. Um, there's also a chance to send yourself into the negative space, but you get some bonuses along with that. So like the other spaces, uh, the other locations on the board, only the, the majority uh, player gets the negative. But a lot of the game is just sending everybody else into that space. I think, Chris, you were the beneficiary of that through most <laughs> of the game. If if somebody's in the lead like Chris was, you just keep packing him in there, and there's neg <laughs> negative spaces. So um, when you play the base game, it's it's just the normal buildings, and then you have that empty kind of courtyard space. Yeah. When you play the Revolution the palace you have this little board that kind of fits into the middle and then you have another space which is probably the highest point value space you can have and has a little guard house which protects all of your cubes anarchy as drew was saying <laughs> where i spent most of my time is <laughs> they have two negative spaces the first one is jail so you can pick the warden and send people to jail or you can go to the asylum now the benefit of the asylum, even though it has a negative point value, is that you'll be able to get really good stuff. You'll get the blackmail, you get a force just by using the heretic. So, yeah. and you know, it's nice because one thing about revolution is if somebody starts to roll a bit, it's kind of hard to kind of keep them down. And as I was starting to roll in this game, Everyone kind of realized that, and they kept throwing me in jail and moving my my cubes around to the asylum. 
So you're talking minus 30 for the asylum, minus 30 for the jail, although there is a garden which has six spaces and is plus 10 for each of those. Okay, I didn't think that any of those three areas in the middle were, were utilized correctly or well utilized. This is why I'm, I'm not excited about this, and I don't think it's really a buy. Um, because in Anarchy, I, we didn't really use those garden spaces till the very end, which doesn't make sense because there are 10 points, just one cube, 10 points. That's the best value in the whole board, but nobody was using them till the very end. Um, sending you to jail, Chris. <laughs> yes, yeah, true. Once you had the majority, it was a waste of time sending more cubes there. It didn't really matter. Yes. We just kept sending you there, but it didn't change anything. To be fair, and I... As far as... Be... Yeah? To be fair, I did try to get out of jail many times, so I was I was taking the spaces where it allowed me to swap cubes and replace cubes throughout the game, but you guys just kept throwing me in there so much I eventually gave up. Yeah, right. It, and because, yeah, you knew you were going to get negative, so, you know, once you reached that point, you couldn't change anything. The, uh, the Asylum also, um, how do I put this? The Asylum, I think, was had too many loopholes in it because once those spaces, the asylum and the jail are filled, you, when you send somebody there or send yourself there, you swap out a cube with another cube. So it bumps it out, I had, yeah. yeah, I had a cube in the asylum. So when I got the heretic and got all the good stuff, I put my cube in the asylum, replacing the cube I already had there. So it's like, it didn't really hurt me. Once the asylum's filled, you can't really be hurt anymore. Once the jail is filled and you have the majority, you can't be hurt anymore. It, there's a limited effect that it has on the game. And and like I said, the garden with the positive spaces, the 10 points, wasn't really utilized at all till the very end. Um, I, I just think it's... It, I don't know. I don't think it adds anything to the game. The palace, on the other hand, like you described it, very interesting twist, and there's a big fight for it. But... Anarchy, no. I'll, I'll leave that alone. I think that's not a vital part, a vital expansion to the game. I got to say, I had the opportunity to play Aquasphere, a uh, Stefan Feld game, and we're big Feld fans, as hopefully you all are. I mean, if you're going to have a salad, it's got to be one made by Feld. It's got to be <laughs> a <just> point salad. <laughs> now, we just played La Isla, right? That just came We did. Out. You mean... I mean, there's another Stefan Feld game? That's what he pipeline? does, Drew. He releases six games a year. That's what he does. This is what oh, he does. Man. And I got to say this, too. The board game design is not his full-time job. <laughs> He's a teacher in oh, Germany, wow. and he does this on the side. He's, this guy's a, a maniac. It's a machine. God bless him. <laughs> we have to go out lunch and have salads together because it would be truly thematic. But as I was kind of <laughs> playing with Anthony a little bit, when I was playing Aquasphere, the, the first thing that just struck me when looking at the player board, looking at the meeples covering the victory point areas, looking at the larger, in this case, submarine meeples, which reminded me greatly of Terra Mystica. I was basically playing Stefan Feld's version of Terra Mystica. <laughs> huh. I, was like, I, I, I know the reviews on this before. are a little mixed, but that sounds awesome. So <laughs> When you put it that way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I backed this game. I have it on my shelf. I just haven't played it yet. So I'm very interested in what Chris has to say. Well, you know, Terra Mystica is an outstanding game. It's number two on Board Game Geek right now, and it deserves to be up in that area. I don't know if number two really is where it should finally land, but Terra Mystica is a lot of fun. And Aquasphere is, uh, I guess, a re-implementation of a lot of those same mechanics, so the game itself is about using scientists to program robots. And once these robots are programmed, you're going to go to different spots in the aquasphere in order to get a number of different resources. So in order to take actions, you're going to pick up these time tokens. That's one of the spots in which you can program a robot in a certain area to take those time. There's also these black gems. There's also these octopide kind of octopus kind of little meeples which you gotta knock out in order to score the maximum victory points for controlling an area you have submarine tokens which you'll take off your board and place in those different areas which will then unlock additional victory points there's also 
these special cards that will give you special abilities throughout the game. And then you have these spots that pretty much let you do whatever programming and action you really want to do for that game. So it's very Terra Mystica. You play Terra Mystica, you'll know how to play this game. The thing about this game, which is interesting, is that it's beautiful, it's colorful, the graphic design is very nice for it. Some of the symbols are a little small and it takes a little bit getting used to, but the programming action, the aquasphere, you know, everything makes sense. And, you know, once you get past the first round of trying to figure out how to program your robot, because there is a board for programming your robot. So if you go to if you go towards one area, it blocks you off from going to another area. So you have to be a little strategic, almost like a rondelle, where once you head starting one way, you can't go back. So you use your scientists to program your robots. You get your engineers out there to take those special abilities and resources. You control those certain areas, and at the end of the round, you score those victory points. And then just like any good Euro, any Stefan Feld game, you're scoring victory points throughout, but the person with the most victory points at the end of the game wins. It has a little bit of a modular sense to it, so the pieces kind of lock together, and there's a center area that determines where additional resources will be placed. So it has some variability. It has the right mechanics. And, you know, I got to be honest. At first, I was like, eh, I don't know. But after playing this, I honestly think I'm going to be picking this up because it's a Feld. It's a good Feld. It's kind of a light to medium weight Feld. And it's got Terra Mystica all over it. So, you know, why not? It's a buy. Awesome. Chris, you had me at Rondell. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like a programming Rondell, but nonetheless, yes. All right. You know, two yeah. questions. Uh, first, okay. uh, what was the final score? Well, unfortunately, we weren't able to get to the last, last round. Ah. We played through it. But, you know, the thing about the game is when you when you go around the track, there are these, like, certain lines, like these lasers, almost like suburbia, where you have to pay either a crystal or deprogram one of the robots in order to score those points. So it while it is a point salad and you will score a lot of points in this game, Nonetheless, it's holding you back from those 100, 200 point victory point games. Okay, fair enough. Oh, wow. That's not what I expected. That's cool. And then it's thematic- a salad, but it's a side salad. You know, it's not a, <laughs> it's not the big salad. No, it's not a Trajan salad. No. It's not a Amerigo salad. But it's so familiar. If you play a Stefan Feld game, if you play Terra Mystica, you will know this game after the first round, and it's 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 very much a, you know all the elements you played from so many games before kind of squeezed into one brightly colorful rainbow looking type of uh, board game. Awesome. Now, Aquasphere, just that title, it it makes me think of Under the Dome meets Waterworld. Uh, I don't know how does that relate to the. Th- Theme. Do you think that presents that title, Aquasphere? Yeah. Is it, is it a descriptive enough title? I guess so. I mean, you have your little own personal bathosphere, this little kind of section that you'll build up with different sections in order to kind of be able to hold more resources. This is supposed to be Stefan Feld's game with theme. Uh, it's got color. It's <laughs> You know, it's got QT graphic design and a lot of meeples, and the production value is pretty high. So on that level, I'm like, yay! As far as, is it thematic? Uh, Not really. I mean... Okay. He'll get it eventually. I mean, it looks, it looks, it's got the look, it's got the meeples, it's got the colors, but theme-wise, it could have been a pure abstract game, and you wouldn't know the difference. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a Feld. I mean... If you're buying a Feld game and expect theme, you're in the wrong part of the hobby. Whoa. I keep waiting. It's going to happen. It's, it's going to happen. happen. Is that a prediction, Drew? Is that a 2015 yes. prediction? <laughs> yes. In fact, somebody should make a game under the dome plus water world. That would be an interesting, <laughs> uh, interesting game. That's true. But That's it's true. not Aquasphere. <laughs> no. I mean, it's true. Feld will probably release at least two to four games this year. So one of them could be thematic. <laughs> you don't know. 
I would love to see him do a thematic game. I mean, he it hasn't happened yet. There are some games that kind of touch upon it. Bruges has probably the most. This has probably the nicest kind of color to it, but not yet, but it's it's getting there. Getting closer. All right. All right. All right, cool. Uh, this is a game I definitely want to play. It's on my shelf. I have the rule book. It's in my bag. I carry with me to work so I can read on the train. Um, I will try to avoid reading on the plane next week because I know the debacle we had with Lewis and Clark when I did that. <laughs> but I do have some time next week, so we'll see how much reading I get done. Um, I will say one strategy point with this game. You know, when you play a worker placement game, you're always looking to get workers. For Aquasphere, you're always trying to get additional actions, and actions equal time, little time tokens in this game. So I think by the second round, everyone was very concerned with the fact that I collected all of the pieces possible for my bathosphere that would give me and hold more extra time and the special cards for that. So the more time and the more special abilities you can get to accumulate time, it translates to more actions and more actions will have more points. And I think I was clearly running away with the game by the end. So... Like I said, you play Terra Mystica, you play the Feld game, you know this game, you know, five seconds into it. So that's all the stuff we've had at our table in the last week or so. Uh, next up, we're going to throw our new feature your way, and we're going to talk about games that you might like if you also like Settlers of Catan. And now for the feature review. So for our feature review this week, we wanted to provide you yet another service. Now, Settlers of Catan is an absolute classic from 1995. It really defines so much about our industry, bringing new gamers in. It's kind of the quintessential gateway game. But once you play Settlers of Catan, where to go next? And more importantly, when you're playing Settlers of Catan, and it is your first experience, we wanted to talk about if you love blank, try blank, you know, and and by the blanks, we're talking about whatever game that you started with. Maybe there are certain elements of that game that you really enjoyed. Maybe it was the designer. Maybe it was the artwork. Maybe it was the mechanics or the category. There are certain elements to a game that once you play the you play them once, you like to see them in other games. And since there isn't this kind of hold on mechanics, you do find them a lot. Like we just talking about Aquasphere, being able to see so many elements of Terra Mystica in that game. What about Catan? What about this great gateway game that families play? It's really out there in the open. Everyone's playing Catan. You could pick it up at your local big box store. What elements of that game do you really love? And if you took those elements out, what other games have those elements that could kind of open you up to new worlds? So we thought that for this episode, we'll talk about Settlers of Catan, but not in a review so much, but in which elements we really enjoy of that game and what games you should look at to find those great elements. Yeah, this is a real classic of the hobby. It's one of those games that I played years and years and years before I really discovered strategy board games. Um I had a friend out of high school who dragged me online to play this when we both went off to college. It was kind of one of the ways we stayed in touch. And it's, it's so it's been around forever. And there's so many elements of it that are kind of iconic. Um, in fact, it's become so iconic that the companies that publish it are rebranding it to just be Catan. It's not Settlers of Catan anymore. It's just Catan. So you'll probably start seeing a new logo uh, in your local big box store as they start rolling out new packaging. Yeah, it sounds like a Walmart-ish kind of thing. Where they want to <laughs> simplify always. I, I did hear, the, though, that the uh, the Star Trek variation of the game, it, it's going to be called Katan! <laughs> with a K, right? With a K. Yes, yes with a K. Oh, that's perfect. Um uh, and actually, speaking of, and I won't do it because I don't want to blow everyone's ears out, <laughs> but speaking of Star Trek Catan and the original Catan, if you were interested in a versus battle there or just maybe a simple comparison, hopefully you had the opportunity to check out 
we actually did a versus slash comparison of Catan and Star Trek Catan in episode 14. Wow, that was before my time. Yeah, that was that was one of the early, early verses. It might have been the first one, um, which is, to, uh, you know, just in, if you haven't listened to that, just spoiler, uh, Star Trek Catan is awesome. <laughs> um, it that is. is. That is the version I own. It's the so, version I own, too. Although I did have an original version of the game that was uh, borrowed slash never returned. So <laughs> I technically have them both if I ever get the first one back. But uh, the Star Trek version is pretty spectacular. And it would explain a lot that Klaus Tauber is probably a Vulcan anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, German Vulcan, it's close enough. Same thing, right? Right. <laughs> Before we get too off topic, though, we did have uh, nine games we wanted to share with you that are similar to Catan in various ways that we've kind of, that Chris talked about. And, and that's the point of this feature. We want to talk about the stuff we like about Catan and probably you do too, if you like this game. And then games that you're also probably going to like based on those mechanics or elements of the game. Um, this, again, is a new feature. You're probably going to hear from us in the future more on this one. Um, and it's kind of a fun way to explore games that uh, maybe you can't directly point to the reason why you like X and Y, but the mechanics or the aesthetics or design or whatever it is kind of tie it all together. And so we're going to start with the ultimate uh, hobby board game classic on that front. If you like X, try out Y then. Why not, right? Exactly. You know what? I got to tell you, a lot of people are liking X. They're liking Catan. I keep re every week. There's like some news about uh, people playing Catan. Um, just this week, a lot of deal was made uh, about the Green Bay Packers playing Catan in the locker room, and oh, wow. how it helps them. Uh, uh, you know, helps them focus, get relaxed, keeps their minds engaged. Um, they're, they're really bringing a lot of people into the game store up in Green Bay. So, yeah, I would be a hundred percent rooting for these guys if they were not playing Seattle this week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because of that, uh, boo! <laughs> but you're Come you're, on. you're you're conflicted though on some level, right? As a board gamer, you're no. it's fighting with your Seattle nah. upbringing. Half the board game <laughs> companies in the U.S. are in Seattle. I don't. I'm I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm all good. <laughs> uh, go see Hawks. <laughs> They've already won one. Let somebody else win. No, no, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait nine. I don't care. <laughs> well, Green Bay did its job by knocking off Dallas, so they can go away now. Is that what you're saying? They can. <laughs> I, I have no opinion of Green Bay. I just want Seattle to win. I, I like Green Bay fine in any other okay. week of the year. Um, and that is awesome. It is cool to see it in other places. Uh, I know it pops up all over the place, pop culture-wise. And, you know, we don't want to get too far off on a tangent with this one. But the point is, Catan is a, uh, it's an institution in our hobby and in pop culture in general. Like, the fact that it's so well-known that they're rebranding it with just that one word that everybody knows, Catan. What you know. was it? Famously, um, Elizabeth Banks and Woody Harrelson played it a lot on the set of um, Hunger Games. So that's it's the go-to game now for the celebrities. Yeah, it's one everybody knows. So that's cool. There's a good chance anybody listening to this has, at the very least, seen somebody play it if they haven't played it themselves. And uh, let's dive in and talk about the nine games that we think you should be playing if you like this game. Well, the thing I enjoyed about Catan is the trading part. And yes, I have traded wood for sheep. I... <laughs> I think all of us have at one point. Come on, Drew. <laughs> this is a clean podcast. Um, so we've all we've all done that. And I think a lot of people who come to Catan like that because it's interactive. Uh, so many European games are just a bunch of people playing solitaire. That's why a lot of people who don't like Agricola don't like Agricola. But Catan adds a, a uh, an interactive element that keeps you engaged throughout the whole game. And so anyone who likes that part of Catan will like games that feature trading. And I wanted to find a classic to start off this discussion. I was thinking of Pit. That's the ultimate trading game from like the early 1900s. It's fierce and, and frenetic. 
Um, maybe a little too much so for people that are just learning board games. So I thought of another classic, Monopoly. Oh. I, I know that it's oh. like at the bottom of the board game geek. What? You know, if you play Monopoly right, it's actually a good game. Whoa, 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 whoa. And <laughs> Controversial yes. thing you've ever said, Drew. <laughs> there are two things about Monopoly that really make it halfway decent. The auction bidding, if done right, and the trading part. There's a lot of negotiations and trading that goes on, and too many people who learn Monopoly and play it, they just roll the dice and move around the board and buy things, and that's it. No. They're, to really succeed at that game, you got to know what property is worth and when to trade. It's timing. Trading is all a matter of timing, finding the right partner and then making the deal at the right time. Monopoly has that. So I'm not going to go on any longer than that. Try it. Just focus on the auction and trading mechanics. You'll find it's a better game than, than you used to play. Um, the second the game, going a little, little deeper, a little more difficult, is Genoa. Um, designer uh, Rudiger Dorn created that. It used to be called The Traders of Genoa. Then it was reprinted as just Genoa, just like Catan. <laughs> it was changed from Settlers of Catan. You see a trend here. Um, I, 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 I ended up with that as one of my top three choices because of everything I've read. I've never had the pleasure of playing it. It is in print. You can buy it in Amazon and at your local store, many of them, I'm sure, and many of your online stores. It's available. So I'm going to have to grab a hold of it because a lot is being made of how great this game is and how the interactive elements, the trading elements, you're, you're trading locations and movements between locations. Um, and the negotiation skills required, I, it's the idea of trading locations. Um, again, there's, there's auction bidding involved. And when you have, like, the first player and you have certain locations, you can, you can trade away different advantages you have for other advantages. It's a game that keeps you engaged all the way through, and that's what a good trading game should do. And then finally, uh, the third choice, the heaviest of the three, and it's a game I've played and really enjoyed, Colosseum. It is a really heavy game that has a couple of different mechanics involved, but I think the key mechanic is the trading. You have a lot of resources that you need to put together in order to to succeed in the game, you're not going to get all of those resources. You have to look constantly at what the other players have and look for the right time to trade what you have for what they have. You're, you're always going to try to trade at an advantage, giving away something extra that you know someone else needs desperately so that you can get a, a vital piece for yourself. Um, it, As time factor, the trading part of Colosseum is small, but I think it plays a crucial part to the success of the game. If you love trading, you got to give Colosseum a try. Those are the three I think you'd enjoy if you enjoy Catan. Okay, cool. I mean, I can agree with you on Colosseum. Um, Genoa, I've not played, but I've heard very good things about Monopoly. That's just craziness. <laughs> You're crazy. Uh, play it right. You'll enjoy it. Crazy. It's crazy. Um, and but, that's really a very important part to Catan, the, the social aspect of the game, when to trade, how much to trade, if someone's in the lead, not to trade to them at all. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and, you know, to manage your hand of cards on that, too. It's, it's a tricky, tricky game. Yeah. I love trading games, so. It is a fun element, yep, and it uh, brings out interesting parts of people. <laughs> including my <laughs> wife, who's very interesting when we're trading resources. Um, <laughs> she's very cutthroat in ways that I've, I don't generally experience. Um, so I, I agree. I like that a lot. Coliseum definitely pulls it off pretty good. Yeah. Um, one of the elements that I wanted to uh, kind of compare to and kind of point out is the, uh, the dice rolling aspect of Catan. Um, this is one of my favorite parts of the game for a couple reasons. Uh, First, it makes the game kind of infinitely replayable. Uh, the game is, is different every time you play it because you never know what the dice are going to do. Um, and there's always that matter of probability, which is cool. So 
uh, when you're laying out the tiles, when you're deciding where you're going to go, you want to kind of play to the probability of your options. Um, certain numbers are going to come up on two dice more often than others. To, you know, put it as simple as possible, but it's still dice, so you never know. Like a three might get rolled more often than you expect. And that's one of the fun parts of this game. And then the other cool thing about the dice is that it keeps everybody involved. Every time you roll the dice, everybody gets to do something. Uh, ah. Well, potentially everybody gets to do something. Um, heck, sometimes when you roll the dice, you do, you do nothing and everybody else gets to do something. <laughs> um, God, yeah. So I was thinking of games that kind of fit um, two or more of those kind of definitions of how the dice roll in Catan. And the easiest one, for a number of reasons, uh, is a 2014 release, at least here in the States, and that's Machi Koro. Um, this is a game we reviewed uh, two or three months ago on the podcast. And, you know, it's not a game we thought was as spectacular as everybody was saying, if only because it kind of needs that expansion. It needs something to kind of give it a little more life. Um, but if you look at the core mechanics of what it does, it's a lot like Catan. It's it's enough like Catan that it's obvious that whoever designed it was looking at Catan while they were designing this game and thinking, how do I put cards in that game <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and remove the tiles? Um, you roll dice every round, and it will affect any number of people playing. Um, there are ways to steal stuff from other people or be stolen from based on what you roll. Uh, everybody's constantly engaged. Uh, different cards have different numbers on them, so the probabilities of the dice rolls that you could have are directly affected by which cards you pick and what you buy. Um, it is very much Catan with cards, but it is very unique in its own way, too. It's not the deepest game in the world. It's definitely an entry-level game. It's not mind-blowingly uh, strategic once you've played it a few times, but with the expansion, it definitely grows a little bit, and uh, there's enough room in that box that I bet there's going to be a bunch more expansions so um this is one of the better more modern games that uses that dice rolling mechanic um in a really cool way well it has that dirty on your neighbor aspect that Catan has with the robber so that's um so it does have those uh, a number of elements that Catan has yeah it does it, it really does and even if you hadn't already heard people saying that on other podcasts or on the forums um while you're playing the game at least a couple of us were like Wow, this is a uh, this is Japanese Catan, right? It's not <laughs> it's, it's not very yeah. thinly veiled. <laughs> um, but I like it for that. I like it for the you know the potential it has moving forward, and I really like it for how easy it is to teach and to get people involved. Um, Definitely. Over the holidays, this was an easy one to pull out. So the next game that I thought was interesting, and it's not nearly quite as close of a fit as Machi Koro. But it's, it's a lot of fun, and it uses dice in kind of a cool way, and that's Kingsburg. Um, hmm. We could also say Alien Frontiers, but I don't really like that game as much, and uh, I haven't played it as often. So let's stick with Kingsburg, because that's a game I do like. And, and it also fits with the theme a lot better, too. Exactly. It's more of a medieval, mm -hmm. um, agrarian oh, yeah. type of theme. Yeah. It's it's a worker placement game, but you're using dice. Um, you're going to play to the probabilities of the dice. There are ways to mitigate those probabilities. Um, and generally speaking, you know, it doesn't have quite the same level of interaction, per se, that Catan does. But it does use dice in a way that requires you to pay attention to um, what the potential is in different areas. And then, because it's a worker placement game... Um, what you roll and what other people roll matters. So if you, whatever anybody else rolls at the table, it's going to affect what you do with your dice. Um, so there's never a moment where you're just sitting there and not paying attention because someone's doing their little solitaire turn. Um, you need to pay attention to where they're placing their dice, what they're rolling, how they're moving, because it could affect where you're able to go when it's your turn. So that's a really fun one for me. I love worker placement games anyways. So putting dice in there and pulling that aspect of Catan um, really made this like uh, a no-brainer game for me. Like anytime it comes out, I will gladly play it. I really I like the idea of being yet. able to roll the dice, to have this random element to get you resources that for a typical Euro, it's just, oh, I'm taking my worker, I'm going there, I'm picking up the resources. So it adds such a, 
an element of, you know, gambling, risking, dynamic game playing. You never know what's going to happen in that season. So I like that a lot. Well, it's tension. And you can see that with new people. I've seen that with new people in Catan is they're anxious. They want to roll that dice, see what they get. They're, you know, they're looking forward to it, to the results. So tension is good in a game. Absolutely. Yeah, and this is a game that plays differently every time. It's a lot of fun, and it doesn't take forever. So um, the last one that uh, uses dice, and, you know, I haven't spoken super highly of this game in the past. It's not one of my favorite Stefan Feld games, but it is a good game. I could admit that. Um, and it uses the dice mechanic, interestingly, in a way that affects everybody at the table, and that's Bruges. Um, mm -hmm. Love uh, Bruges. <laughs> <laughs> how you roll those dice is going to affect everybody you know not only in you know what how the round's going to play out but what types of things you're going to face throughout that round and i know chris you were telling me about the expansion that it uses it even a little bit more right yeah so when you roll these d6s the one and twos will determine the amount of money that people will have to pay to go up the reputation track and typically the five and six determines the threats that will affect everybody but here, with the expansion, the threes and fours, if they're rolled, will determine resources that will become available to you by ships. So it adds an extra dimension to the game. And just like Catan, rolling those dice affects everybody and affects the resources for that round. Yeah, yeah that's oh, awesome. Good match, then. Good yep. match. Yep, and it's... Bruges, you know, it's always one of those games that I just never quite got into as much as the people other people at the table but um mechanically speaking it definitely is a solid game and with the expansion which i have not yet played but i am interested in because everything i've read about it um seems like it really uh, pulls in some of the elements i thought were lacking in the base game so it's awesome i i would like to try it <laughs> it'll definitely be on the playlist next time we uh, get to the table so for me when i get a chance to play Catan, one of the most interesting dynamics of the game is the initial placement phase so when you're thinking of Catan, whether you use the standard setup or use more of a random setup, placing those hexagons out on the board that have the resources there and then where you start your settlements and where you start your roads makes a huge difference. And then how you expand your control of those hexes really makes or breaks you in the game. You know, the thing about Catan is everyone's looking at trading, everyone's looking at resources, everyone's looking at development cards. But if you pay attention to controlling the right hexes early on and throughout the game, that game is yours. This is a Euro area control game of the hex kind. So for me, that was always such a big part of Catan and something I really did love. That's what I really like about that game. So I have three games that if you like controlling hexes, if you like the strategy kind of mitigating some of that randomness, you should check out these games because they have a lot of that Catan elements there. First oh, game up. Oh, tell us. What, the, what are they? <laughs> well, Drew, I will control your conversation by putting my pieces down in that area. <laughs> <laughs> so first off, on, on a little bit of a lighter side there, the Castles of Burgundy. Now, once again, as Anthony was saying, this is a rolling your dice and seeing where your resources are going to be type of game. So the Castles of Burgundy really has a lot of elements of Catan, if you look at it right. Now, it also, for me, as I was saying, you're controlling hexes. Now, instead of having one hex board, you're going to have your own player board. And by rolling the dice, you'll be able to place control over those certain areas that will score your resources and based upon how you expand, because remember, once you start placing in a certain area and you start expanding, you want to control certain segments. And controlling those certain segments and controlling them first will score you a lot of victory points. So once again, we're going back to Feld because Feld takes a little bit of everything and takes the good stuff and makes his own game out of it. So if you're looking for that kind of beginner version of rolling dice and controlling hexes on your own player board, the Castles of Burgundy is for you. Man, great game. game. It's is uh, one of Feld's better games, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and it's so 
I don't want to say bland looking, but it's kind of bland looking. Um, <laughs> you said it after you said you weren't going to say so it. So bland, like everything, and everything's kind of flimsy out of the box. The production on this is not spectacular, but don't let that fool you. The game itself is very solid. It's a lot of fun, high replayability, and yeah, a really solid one if you're looking for like an upgrade from Catan. Well, definitely. If you if you introduce Catan to somebody, it's their very first game. You can't go wrong with Castles of Burgundy because they'll enjoy it. It'll keep them hooked in the hobby, and they'll be ready for something more after that. All right. our sec- So my second choice for controlling hexes in order to control the universe, or in this case, the mystical universe, would have to be Terra Mystica. Just like the Castles of Burgundy, Terra Mystica has that same type of look to its board. You have a number of different hexes which start with a different resource on that area, and your job is to be able to control those areas, terraform that area to fit your race, and by controlling the areas and by controlling how they connect together, you'll score victory points. So once again, the board looks like a version of Catan. And what's even funny here, when you play Terra Mystica for the first time, you are going to find settlements, you're going to find roads, and you're going to find city tokens from Catan in Terra Mystica. I remember the first time we played this. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wait a minute, what's going on here? I thought we bought a brand new game, and it has it has everything from Catan. It was like, was there a Catan garage sale, and they bought all the tokens up? They over overstocked, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew that you could pick up, you know, Catan pieces to make another game? So once again, I I guess if Aquasphere is going to use some elements from Terra Mystica, I guess then it's fair that Terra Mystica uses components from the Cellars of Catan. So once again, you're going to see identical wooden pieces. You're going to see identical hexes. You're going to have your identical kind of starting points in the game. And then from there, you're going to expand throughout all the different hexes to control those different areas and score points. So Terra Mystica has so much of that hex control flavor to it. And once again, it has all those pieces. It's something that is a little bit heavier of a game. But, you know, once you got through the castles in Burgundy and people are still loving that kind of uh, mechanic there, take them on to Terra Mystica. And finally, another game that invokes that hex area control and i'm sure you've played it and i'm sure you've seen it it's trains now typically you think of trains you think of a deck builder game but just one simple look at the board and you're transported back to the settlers of Catan. it has those water hexes it has those land hexes it has those special hexes that are worth certain points and once again the object of this game in part, is to control certain areas to score victory points. And where your train line, or just like your longest road, kind of comes into conflict, it's possible to cut somebody off, it's possible to block them out of some areas, it's possible to make some areas more expensive if they're looking to big build that longest road. So trains is yet another implementation of Settlers Catan's hex area control and route building so if you like deck builders and you like settlers of Catan, trains is kind of the way to go the only thing it's missing is the robber from Catan to rob the trains yeah (laughs) that'd be awesome yeah okay let's combine uh trains with colt express (laughs) and we have the ultimate board game (laughs) Uh, man, I love trains. It's it's one of those games that you always are a little sad because the board's a little too bland. But um, the mechanics of the game, the deck building, they're all fantastic. It's a good, solid, yeah. mechanically sound game. It's just not super pretty to look at. Well, to be fair, if you're looking for a, you know if you're looking for a Settlers of Catan kind of clone next version, Settlers of Catan is kind of bland itself. So this is true. <laughs> All right, so that is our feature for this week. Next up, let's take a look at our final round. And now, our final round. It is the final round. And coming up are the Winter X Games, uh, January 22nd through 25th. And in honor of Winter X Games, you know what really makes them good? The X stands for extreme. These are extreme sports. And, and the people who, who play these sports, they push it. They push it to the extreme. 
the, the most successful ones are those who push their luck, who do the most dangerous stunts, but who perform them flawlessly. So it made me think, in honor of the Winter X Games, to talk about push your luck games. Um, your favorite ones. My favorite one is, has always been Can't Stop by the legendary by the legendary designer Sid Saxon. It's timeless. Um, you can you still can enjoy it. You can still buy it it's in print. It's just simple rolling dice and moving your men up a track from two through twelve, and trying to be the first to complete three different tracks. And that's all it is. You can you keep rolling until you decide to stop, but you can just keep rolling and try and get all three tracks if you want. If you blow it, you get sent back to where you were at the beginning of the turn. So. Exciting, very simple, classic, can't stop. What what uh, are your favorite push your luck games? Well, one that I really love that you know we talked about before about having that dice rolling element, you, the unpredictability of what's going to come next, and trying to make those matches is rolled for the ages. Whether you do iron or bronze, having these dice that can kind of lead you to victory, whether you get enough goods for that round, you get enough food to feed your people. That's always a challenging aspect. Can I get enough food for my people? But then even beyond that too, can I get enough goods? Because, you know, if you're going to get goods, they can come along with skulls and skulls are negative points. But hey, wait, I I got one skull, but I could still roll my dice. So instead of taking a negative point, you know, maybe I can kind of press my luck. Well, if I roll two skulls, then it's a drought, and I'm going to score negative points. All right, you know what? All right, I, I got this. I'm going to try to roll again, and if I get three skulls, it's negative three points to all of my opponents. So there's an opportunity that even when things get bad, you can continue to roll, and actually all that bad stuff will have to to the other players. So... It really is rolling through the ages in a very much dynamic press your luck. Hopefully you'll save your civilization and not fall apart. (laughs) Hopefully you can get away with starving your people for a turn. That's that's what I usually try to do. Well, I've never, my people have always gone well fed, but I know some other players out there who often press their luck way too far. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. This is a good one because there is so much strategy involved uh, and yet, you can still just go for the big roll on any given round. And it's, it's that part is always fun. That's the best part of a push your luck game. Mm. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, I picked a game that is all about rolling the dice and pushing the limit and seeing just how fast you can go before you crash into the wall in a fiery burst of flames. <laughs> and that is formula D. Um, uh, yeah. This is the classic uh, board game, uh, racing game, in which you roll dice to move your car around the track, but when you shift up, you upgrade to a larger die, so you can move further with that die, Um, but if you are going too fast into a corner, you are going to cause damage to your car. You have to slam on the brakes, or you're just going to kind of go off the side of the track. Um... There's only so much damage you can take. There's only so much you can do to your car, whether it's the tires or the rest of the car or running into other people. Um, And eventually you are going to be out of the race if you push too hard. So you could push really hard early in the race, uh, run to an early start, um, but you're going to slow down a little bit. Or you could play it safe and wait for other people to spin out and blow up their cars, uh, which is usually how someone wins this game. Or... uh, (laughs) You can uh, pace everybody and see how far they're willing to push it. No matter what, though, it's, at some point you're going to have to make a tough decision and play a little bit of uh, the odds and roll a die you probably shouldn't to see if you can pull it off. And, you know, but but I don't think of this as a dice game. I know most push your luck games are dice, but they're from what you described, there's a lot of strategy. It's all about. You know, the choices, what gear you plan to go in and how much risk you're willing to to take um, even before you roll the die. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to deny that this game is essentially roll and move. Um, It's got a lot more strategy than a typical roll and move because there's different types of die and you can be going different speeds and it has different effects on things. But how I've always played it is uh, roll, move, roll, move, crash. 
And <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of fun with that. Some people do not, so I don't begrudge them that. Um, but it is so much fun to see just how close you can come to crashing without crashing in, in your bid for victory. Um, and when the strategy becomes involved, if you're playing against people who play this game a lot, it's that much better. So for me, but this see, is one of the ultimate push your luck games. I love it. If uh, I wish I only wish I could find more people who also loved it. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll play it with you. You, you to, could you could find them, but unfortunately, they pressed their luck and you know blew up in their car. So, <laughs> but uh, that that game Formula D, Anthony, I think is in the true spirit of the Winter X games. It's really extreme. You got to push it to win. That's for sure. Yeah, you can't hey, win whoa, this game whoa. conservative unless everybody else explodes. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, roll through the ages. You could starve your people or start a revolution. I don't know what you guys have been talking about. You could build monuments and you could, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Real exciting. <laughs> Building well, civilizations. Oh, come on. Does roll through the ages have a 30 sided die? See, that's the problem. This is why roll through the ages is probably not the press your luck, the best press your luck game because once you get to roll the 30 sided die, you just don't want to leave the 30 sided die. You never want to go back. back to a D6 again. <laughs> No, and that's where you, you press your luck. Should I roll this D thirty again? No, but I'm going to do it because it's awesome. Damn that's, it, that's a wall. That's what that's what I'm saying. There is no choice there. You're not pressing your luck. There's no going back. You're a gamer. Someone gives you a giant D thirty. You're rolling the giant three D thirty, man. Come on. The, the whole point of Formula D is to go out in a blaze of glory. Yes. I've never seen anybody play that game for the first time and not get up to that gear and roll that D thirty. And it never goes well. There's only there's only one spot of the entire board where you can even do it and not crash, and you're never ready. Uh, man. No, it's a good game. It's a good game. I like it. And that is our final round, guys. All right. So that is the uh, whole episode for this week. Obviously, we let off with a big piece of news. We are on Patreon officially. So make sure you step on over there. Check out the rewards we have up. Watch our quick intro video. Um, share it with your friends, post it to Board Game Geek, get the word out there to anybody who it, either you know has listened to us or maybe hasn't and uh, would be interested. Um, and in the meantime, you know, between doing that, hop over to iTunes, drop us five stars, share the word. Our listeners are the reason we do this, and that's why we get excited to talk about games and share this with everybody. So um, definitely get the word out for us, let us know what you think, and uh, that just makes it so much more fun for us. Um, of course, you can drop comments for us directly on Facebook. Uh, we're on Twitter at BGA Podcast. We have a guild on Board Game Geek. And then there's our website, of course, BoardGamersAnonymous.com. Um, every episode posted there, every episode of Kicking the Habit, all of our blog posts, show notes, everything is up there. You can leave a comment, and we will get back to you right away. And uh, we are everywhere, so you have no excuse. Make sure you reach out. But that is everything for this week. This is Anthony. This is Chris. And this is Drew. And until next time, we hope that you will press your luck and go through the podcast despite our bad accents. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad they didn't carry through the whole episode. <laughs> whoa, whoa, what are you talking about? Stretch <laughs> goal. Forget about it.